Okay, so in the last class, we I was trying to motivate what we mean by passive circuits, and uh, the sort of conclusion that we arrived at was that uh, passive circuits is something where uh, the amount of energy that is supplied to this circuit, this is always positive, and the amount of energy that is supplied to the circuit is uh, bifurcated in two ways. A part of it goes into stored energy which gets stored by the energy storage uh, storing elements in the circuit and the other part gets dissipated. Okay. So, uh, let me write out uh, an equation that uh, sort of captures this idea of passivity. So, this equation is what is called dissipation equality. And uh, what it says is that uh, power supplied is equal to uh, dissipated power plus the rate of change in stored energy. Well, as far as dissipated, dissipated power is concerned, this dissipated power is always going to be something which is positive. Therefore, I could take this rate of change of stored energy to the other side and I can always say that power supplied minus the rate of change in stored energy is some quantity which is always going to be positive. Now, in case of a circuit, of course, what we can do is we can write this down the power supplied is V dot I and uh, so the stored energy is denoted by E then D E D T. So, V i minus d e d t is greater than equal to 0. This greater than equal to 0 essentially this, this is in fact equal to the dissipated power and the dissipated power is always a positive quantity. So, V dot V dot i minus d e d t is greater than equal to 0. This in fact is called the dissipation inequality and this dissipation inequality is always going to hold true for circuits which are passive. Okay. Now, um, how do we characterize circuits which are passive? Okay. Now, um, uh, importantly, uh, the circuit, the examples of the circuits that we were looking at, it has one input and one output. And typically in, uh, in circuits, uh, the number of inputs is equal to the number of outputs because we think of circuits in terms of ports and each port has a voltage and a current and so one of them either the voltage or the current you think of as the input and the other one as the output and so the circuits are the special kinds of um, uh, systems where the number of inputs is equal to the number of outputs. So, of course, uh, till now in the example that we were looking at, it was a single input, single output uh, uh, case, but you could also look at a multi input, multi output case where uh, you have a whole vector of voltages and currents of various ports forming the input and uh, another whole vector of the, uh, the corresponding currents and voltages on those ports as the output. And then just like we talk about V dot I, you could just talk about the inner product of the input and the output uh, giving you the, uh, the energy supplied and uh, there would be a storage function depending upon the number of uh, uh, depending upon the various energy storing uh, elements which are there in the system and one could write out the dissipation inequality which says that the inner product of the input and the output minus the uh, the rate of change of the uh, stored energy, this is always going to be greater than or equal to 0 because this quantity in fact is going to be the dissipated power and the dissipated power is always a positive quantity. Okay. So, um, let me just constrain myself to a single input, single output.
case and uh, let us say the single input single output situation uh, is given in k, uh, using a transfer function as y s is equal to some g s u s where y is the output and u is the input. Okay. Now, uh, earlier what we had said was that u transpose y, this is the same in the case of the electrical uh, circuit V dot i is exactly the same as u transpose y. And we are saying that u transpose y integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, this particular quantity should be greater than 0, then the system is passive. Okay. Now, if you are going to take the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of u transpose y, one could take the Fourier transforms and if one takes the Fourier transforms, this is the same as okay, there would be some scaling factor k and minus infinity to plus infinity of u j omega uh, star times g j omega Ah, well, g j omega star y j omega, but of course, this u transpose y I could really write it down as half of u transpose y plus half of y transpose u. So, uh, sort of making it symmetric. Therefore, along with this expression, there will be this other expression also, which is y j omega star uh, g j omega u j omega. Okay. So, this integral uh, of course, this is over d omega. So, uh, this integral would be equivalent to this integral after having taken the Fourier transforms. So, we have taken Fourier transforms. Okay. Now, if you look at this expression, this is the same as saying Uh, well, I think I have made a mistake. Uh, sorry. Okay, so let me do it again. So, uh, if you're looking at this from minus infinity to infinity of u transpose y dt, this is in the time domain. This is equal equal to some constant of proportionality. Of course, this u transpose y uh, u transpose y. I could write it out as. Uh, a half u transpose y plus a half y transpose u. Okay. Now, uh, I could uh, I could now pass over using Fourier transforms into the uh, into the uh, uh, j omega uh, uh, into the omega domain, and I will have again integral from minus infinity to infinity of u j omega star y j omega. Uh, plus y j omega star u j omega. Okay. So, the last time uh, the mistake I made was that I put this g j omega in between. Now, uh, I can uh, I can bring in the g j omega by substituting you see why once you have taken the transforms y j omega is really g j omega times u j omega. And so, substituting this in there we would end up with integral minus infinity to plus infinity. I am just forgetting the proportionality constant. You have u j omega star multiplying g j omega plus g j omega star multiplying u j omega. Okay. Now, uh, of course, when I write this down, there are several assumptions that are going in. The assumptions that are going in are the following. For example, uh, we will assume that u is a compactly supported trajectory. That means, if this is the time axis, u is non-zero only over a compact set. Now, if u is non-zero over a compact set, then it is easy to take the Fourier transform. It makes sense to take the Fourier transform. Now, if u is compactly supported, 
because uh, the transfer function tells us that y is equal to g times u, this is the equation. Therefore, the, the Fourier transform of y also makes sense and if u is compactly supported in the circuit, we would assume, uh, we, we can expect that y is also compactly supported and so then it makes sense to take the Fourier transforms. And now, if you take the Fourier transforms, the Fourier transform of y and the Fourier transform of u is related in this way and so once you have this expression, you substitute and you get this. And now, this is this integral is greater than or equal to 0. So, if you look at this last expression, whatever u you choose, this expression must be positive. And uh, now, one can show that this expression would only be positive if g j omega plus g j omega star is greater than or equal to 0. But this here is really the real part of g j omega. And so, the real part of g j omega must be greater than or equal to 0. So, um, this condition is the condition for passivity and the condition for passivity translates to and here of course, we are only considering single input, single output case. So, the single input, single output case the y and the u, the output and the input are related to the through this transfer function g of s and then what this translates to by this set of manipulations is that the real part of g j omega must be greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So, let us look at uh, situations where the real part of g j omega is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. What does that mean? Now, uh, you see the expression that we had is g j omega plus g j omega star, but this is the same as saying g j omega plus g minus j omega. Now, if g j omega can be written as a plus j b, then this will turn out to be a minus j b. So, the imaginary part gets cancelled out and you are just left with the real part. Okay. So, this being greater than or equal to 0 is the same as saying that the real part of the transfer function g j omega must be greater than or equal to 0. Okay. Uh, how to translate this condition into something more meaningful for us? Okay. One way we can translate this condition into something more meaningful is you see the image of g j omega is the Nyquist plot. Okay. So, saying that the real part of g j omega is greater than or equal to 0 is the same as saying that the Nyquist plot of the transfer function should lie in the first or the second quadrant, because then the real part of g j omega is going to be positive. Okay? So, what this translates to or whatever we have been doing till now, the, this, uh, this result that we have got, what it translates to is that the real part Of, uh, of the transfer function g j omega should be positive yeah and and what that means is that uh, the nyquist plot is in first and uh, uh, fourth quadrant, first and fourth quadrant. Okay. But as it turns out, this Nyquist plot being in the first and the fourth quadrant is not a complete characterization of passivity. Okay. Uh, that is because um, Mathematically, the Nyquist plot lying in the first and the fourth quadrant 
may not necessarily translate into uh, that particular condition that we had where you have a, a storage function and supply function and that interpretation that you have. Okay. Uh, first let us look at some examples of transfer functions which are positive real. Uh, okay, sorry. So, I did not mention that. Uh, so, uh, those transfer functions whose Nyquist plots lie in the first and the fourth quadrant, well, one definition for that is positive real. So, positive real transfer function G s is such that the real part of G j omega is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. Uh, I cannot claim that this is the definition of positive real because uh, depending upon various books, the definition of positive real changes. Okay. Now, the earlier interpretation that we had for passivity the one would like to say that positive real transfer functions is equivalent to passive, but that is actually strictly not true because if you give the definition of positive real to be that the real part that the Nyquist plot lies in the first and the fourth quadrant, then one can show that there are some transfer functions which will satisfy this condition of positive reality, but are not actually passive. So, uh, so it turns out that in many books, they use the definition of positive reality to be, uh, to be the fact that the Nyquist plot lies in the first and the fourth quadrant. Whereas, in many other books, the definition for positive reality says that the real part of the transfer function evaluate, that means the Nyquist plot lies in the first and the fourth quadrant, but in addition, the transfer function is stable. Okay. So, uh, now I would um, give some examples to try and uh, tell you what exactly is, uh, is the difference between uh, defining positive reality in this way and defining positive reality in, uh, in the sense of this plus G s being stable. Okay. So, uh, let us look at some examples. So, suppose you look at the transfer function G s equal to 1 by s. Now, this transfer function is it positive real? Well, if you just take this definition, then g of j omega is 1 upon j omega. This, therefore, the real part of g of j omega is equal to 0, and so the real part is greater than or equal to 0. So, one can say that this transfer function is positive real. Okay. If one uses the definition that uh, positive real means this, plus G s is stable, if one uses that trans, if, if one uses this definition, then again this particular pos uh, this particular transfer function is positive real because the real part is actually 0. And this is also stable means s being uh, s being a pole at 0, if you think of that as stability or marginal stability or whatever goes, then uh, one can still continue to call this positive real. Okay. So, the definition of positive reality could be just this or could be this along with g s being stable. Again, you know, as I said earlier, it depends on the books that you follow. Some books use only this definition, but most most books use this definition plus the fact that GS is stable. So let me use a few more examples to to show why there is a difference between just having this condition, which is the condition that we got from the earlier equations that we derived, and also having this condition that GS is stable. Okay, so um, let me take another transfer function. G s is um, s plus one upon s plus two. Okay, now 
if we look at the Nyquist plot of this, the Nyquist plot of this at s equal to 0, it is at half. And then, okay, so this, this particular transfer function has a 0 at minus 1 and it has a pole at minus 2. So, as you go up, you find at any particular j omega, there is this angle which is larger than this angle and so it is going to be positive and as uh, j omega tends to infinity, this finally tends to 1. So, you end up with a Nyquist plot which looks like this goes to 1. And then uh, when you look at the, the rest of it, this is what you get. And so, you uh, it is clear that the real part of g j omega is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So, by that definition that the real part of g j omega is greater than or equal to 0, this transfer function is positive real. Of course, if you also put in the fact that it should be stable, well this transfer function is also stable. Therefore, by both the definitions, this transfer function is positive real. Let me now take another transfer function which is g s is um, let us say s minus 1 now uh, this transfer function of course is not stable Now, if we were to draw the Nyquist plot of this, it has a pole at minus 1, uh, at plus 1 and it has a 0 at the origin. Now, uh, if you now look, if you plot this thing as you go up, so at uh, omega equal to 0, this gives you 0. And then as you increase the omega, what you would get is the real part of g j omega is equal to uh, the real part of minus j omega multiplying minus 1 minus j omega upon uh, 1 plus omega squared. Okay, and this then turns out to be, so perhaps I should not use a minus here, I should just put plus. Huh? So, if I take this transfer function, so s upon s minus 1, this is uh, not stable and uh, wh when you calculate this is plus and so you get uh, 1 plus omega squared, uh, yeah. And so, in the numerator, so, the real part will turn out to be omega squared upon 1 plus omega squared and this quantity here is greater than 0 for all omega, greater than equal to 0 for all omega. So, if you use the definition that the real part of the transfer function is greater than equal to 0, then this thing is positive real, this transfer function is positive real. But if in addition you also put in the condition of stability, this is not stable, therefore this, this transfer function is not positive real. Okay. Now, um, the question is why was this uh, condition of stability brought in to uh, associate these transfer functions with passivity. Now, that is completely dependent on, on what one would call the storage functions. Okay. So, it turns out that uh, if you have a transfer function like this, you are not going, it would not be possible to synthesize a circuit which has this transfer function using purely passive elements. And the reason for that is because this g of s is not stable. As a result, the associated storage function that you would get, that you can get for this particular transfer function, that storage function is not going to be positive definite. 
Okay, so let me uh, let me explain what I mean by that. So earlier I had said that the storage function is a bit like a Lyapunov function. That means if you set the input to zero and then you look at the system, uh, then the storage function plays the role of the Lyapunov function. Now the Lyapunov function of course has to satisfy certain conditions that is one of the conditions being that the Lyapunov function must be a positive definite function and uh, its derivative must be negative definite. Now the fact that the derivative is negative definite will get satisfied because of uh, the dissipation inequality. So just recall that the dissipation inequality gives us uh, something like this uh, u transpose y is greater than equal to d dt of e where e is the storage function. Okay? But now what does this mean? If the input is 0, of course this quantity is 0 and so 0 is greater than d dt of e which means for the system with 0 input this e can act like a Lyapunov function provided of course e is positive definite. So if e is positive definite here this thing essentially tells us that the derivative of e is negative semi definite and as a result the resulting uh, system the system that you get by setting the input to 0 is a system which is stable. Therefore it is important that this storage function that you get should be positive definite. Now, um, when we use the definition of positive real transfer function, to be equivalent to the real part of g j omega greater than equal to 0 then this condition alone gives us no guarantee about the positive definiteness of the storage function. So this condition gives no guarantee about positive definiteness. of E. Okay? So that is why uh, many people would like to call a transfer function positive real when not only this condition is satisfied but it also guarantees that the storage function that would result in the system is a positive definite storage function. Okay? Now in fact the guarantee for that is given by a famous lemma uh, which is called the positive real lemma. Okay? And so let me state the positive real lemma. Okay, so the positive real lemma okay. So let's take a transfer function g of s, which is stable, and let's assume that this transfer function is written in uh, as a as a state space model, and so you have equations dx dt equal to a x plus b u y equal to c x plus d u and let us assume that this representation is a minimal representation. So, so the minimal representation essentially guarantees that a b is controllable and a c is observable. Okay. So, what we are saying is we start out with a transfer function. Of course, 
I'm just restricting myself right now to single input, single output case. So we are taking a transfer function, which is stable. Look at the state space representation and the state space representation that we are looking at is a minimal representation, which means the A, B, C, D matrices are such that A, B is controllable and A, C is observable. Okay. Then, the real part of G s is greater than or equal to 0. So, G s is already stable that we have assumed. Then, real part of G s is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. If and only if there exists matrices P, L, W of appropriate dimensions, dimensions such that, okay. So, what we are saying is that the real part of G s is going to be greater, oh, sorry the real part of g j omega is greater than or equal to 0. That means, the Nyquist plot is going to lie in the first and the, and the fourth quadrant. If and only if there exist matrices P, L and W of appropriate dimensions such that the following three equations hold. Okay? And the three equations are A transpose P plus P A is equal to minus L transpose L, P times B is equal to C transpose minus L transpose W and W transpose W is equal to D plus D transpose. Okay. Let us look at these three equations and um, think about it for a minute. So, what we are saying is the positive real lemma, what it is saying is suppose you start off with a GS which is stable and you look at the state space representation which is a minimal representation which essentially is equivalent to saying AB is controllable and AC is observable. Then the real part of G j omega is greater than or equal to 0 or in other words Nyquist plot lies in the first and the fourth quadrant if and only if there exist matrices P, L and W of appropriate dimensions such that okay, A which is a system matrix here, A transpose P plus P A. Of course, incidentally this matrix P is going to be a symmetric matrix. Okay, so, P is going to be a symmetric matrix. Okay, and therefore, A transpose P plus P A, this whole thing is going to be symmetric and what we are saying is that, that this matrix is going to be minus L transpose L. Now, if you take any matrix L and you look at L transpose L, that is going to be positive semi definite. I mean, it is guaranteed to be positive semi definite. It could be positive definite if L had the full appropriate rank, but it is guaranteed to be positive semi definite. So, what the first equation is saying is that A trans there is some matrix symmetric matrix P such that A transpose P plus P A is negative semi definite. Okay. Now, this of course already connects P and L because P has appeared here, L has appeared. The next equation connects P and L and W through B and C where B and C come from the state representation. It says P times B is equal to C transpose minus L transpose W and this W is something that purely depends on D. So, if you D plus D transpose, this is a, this is going to be a symmetric matrix and that symmetric matrix is exactly the same as W transpose W. Okay. So, the positive real lemma is something that holds only if you assume G S is stable. Okay. So, if you take away this assumption, that means you do not 
assume G s is stable, then this condition that the real part of G j omega is greater than or equal to 0, if and only if these things, well this does not hold anymore. And now, the point is that this p essentially defines essentially defines the um, it, 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 it essentially defines the storage uh, the storage function okay so yeah so there is one more condition that i need to add which is there exists matrices p l and w with p being positive definite now if if the condition g s is stable is put in then this p is positive definite but if this condition g s is stable is not put in then this p is not guaranteed to be positive definite so the positive real lemma says that if you take a g s which is stable and this is the state space representation it's in a minimal representation so ab is controllable ac is observable then the real part of g j omega is greater than or equal to 0 if and only if there exists matrices p which is a symmetric matrix and positive definite and two other matrices l and w of appropriate dimension such that this all this is true. Okay. So, p is a symmetric matrix and p is greater than 0. Then all these equations are satisfied. Okay. What does all this mean? I mean, okay, so I have just stated a, a, a lemma called the positive real lemma, but what does this finally mean? Okay, what this finally means is that you could think of the storage function for the system. So, the storage function E, one could think of the storage function as x transpose P x, where P came from that positive uh, from from the earlier lemma. So, p is uh, greater than 0, then you are talking about, uh, so if p is uh, positive definite, then you are talking about a storage function which is positive definite. So, now if you have the storage function and you look at d e d t, d e d t is equal to x dot transpose p x plus x transpose p x dot. For x dot you substitute a transpose b uh, because you have the state equation saying x dot is a x plus b u. So, you substitute this in for the x dot and you would end up with uh, u transpose b transpose p x plus x transpose a transpose p x plus x transpose p a x plus x transpose p b u. Okay, I will write this in a more compact form x transpose u transpose and then I have this matrix here and then I have x and u and out here I would have a transpose p plus p a. Then uh, I would have p b here, I would have b transpose p here and 0 here. So, this expression is the same as this. So, uh, what we have got is an expression for d e d t by just using the state space equation and using that p that had appeared in the positive real lemma and I get this. Now, uh, throughout we have been saying that the supply is given by u transpose y. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, a moment here. You see, I have taken the storage function to be x transpose p x. Ideally, this is a quadratic one would put a half here and so what would happen is there would be a half appearing in all these terms because because of the half that I have put there. Okay. So, I will compensate for that by taking the supply to be 2 times 
U transpose y. And you would see that this is, this is just a play with constants. It really does not matter all that much. Okay. Now, so the supply is 2 times u transpose y, but from the state space equations we know y is c x plus d u. So, the supply which is u transpose y, I write it in a symmetric form. So, I will write it as u transpose y plus y transpose u. And so, I plug in this c x plus d u in here and I would end up getting u transpose c x plus u transpose d u plus x transpose c transpose x uh, u plus u transpose d transpose u, which again just like earlier I would write down as x transpose u transpose some matrix x u. There is no x transpose that term is in there. Uh, I have x transpose c transpose u and I have c here and here I have d plus d transpose. So, the supply turns out to be this expression here. Now, for passive systems, we said supply minus the rate of change of energy. This must be equal to dissipation, but this dissipation is of course, going to be greater than equal to 0. Now, we found an expression for the supply. Yeah, So, it is x transpose u transpose with this matrix. So, x u this vector you are using on either side of this matrix. So, I will just use this matrix and sort of suppress this x u. Okay? So, if I write down the supply matrix, I get 0 c transpose c transpose d plus d transpose minus. Now, d e d t again I had a similar expression using x transpose and u transpose which was this. And so, if d e d t is this particular expression, so I can subtract this expression from the earlier expression. So, what I would get is minus a transpose p plus p a, here I will have p b, here I will have b transpose p and here 0. Okay, so, this whole matrix put together pre multiplied by x transpose u transpose and post multiplied by x u, this must be. So, what I have written down here is supply minus d e d t. So, this whole thing must be equal to dissipative, uh, dissipated uh, energy and so, this matrix must be a positive definite matrix is what we should have if, if the given system was passive. Okay, now, if you put this together, then the resulting matrix that you will have, the first entry is going to be minus A transpose P minus P A. Okay, let me write it down. Minus A transpose minus P A. Then here I will have C transpose minus P B. Here I will have C transpose. Uh, no, both of them are not C transpose. One of them, uh, the bottom one is C. So, this is a mistake. C minus B transpose P and here I have D plus D transpose. Okay. So, this particular matrix is the same as this. Now, I am going to use the expressions that I derived that I had written down in the positive real lemma. You see minus A transpose P minus P A if we look at the positive real lemma, A transpose P plus P A is minus L, L transpose L. So, the negative of this is L transpose L. So, for this I could write down L transpose L. Okay? Now, if I look at the second equation, it says C transpose minus P B is L transpose W. So, for C transpose minus P B, I could write down L transpose W and this is just the transpose of that. So, this is W transpose L and then the last equation 
tells us W transpose W is D plus D transpose. So, this I could write as W transpose W, but what this matrix is, this is nothing but L transpose W transpose multiplying L W and this is certainly greater than equal to 0 because this is essentially like squaring a matrix. So, so what we are essentially saying is, so if you go back to the positive real lemma, when you are saying G S is stable and this is true, then it says that there exists all these matrices P which is a symmetric matrix greater than 0 such that these conditions and the other two matrices L and W such that all these conditions are satisfied. Now, what I have just shown here is if you start by considering E the store storage function, if you start by considering the storage function to be x transpose P x where P is obtained from that positive real lemma, then and if you think of the supply as u transpose y, then when you take supply minus the rate of change of storage, then you end up getting this equation and you manipulate that, you get that that thing is going to be greater than or equal to 0. So, what we have essentially shown is that in the positive real lemma, if all these conditions hold, then if all these conditions hold, then you have passivity. But as far as this lemma is concerned, we have not shown either way. What we have shown is, if these conditions are satisfied, then uh, uh, the system is passive. So, now uh, I seem to be out of time for this lecture and so in the next class, I would uh, show the positive real lemma and uh, the implication, the necessity and the sufficiency I would prove in the next class.